In this video, Karen's demon semen holds my kid hostage on Easter. Yes, it's my truck, and no, I won't help you move, and no, you can't buy it for 50 bucks. And corrupt manager wants me to reject crucial supplies. I do as instructed. Karen's demon semen holds my kid hostage on Easter. Safe to say I do not get along with my wife's family. They blame me for turning her gay. So during holiday get-togethers, I focus on the kids or tuck myself into a corner away from everyone else. That's where I was when the trouble began. The small house was crowded with bodies of Easter dinner pre-pandemic, and since the kids were off playing, I had settled in a seat in the corner. My sister-in-law rounded the corner with large eyes to tell me, so daughter is screaming for you. I was struck by her wording as I got up and I asked, she's calling for me? No, she's screaming. Well, that kicked my parental instincts into high gear, and I bolted to the playroom down the hall. I could hear my daughter, seven at the time, screaming and wailing even before I reached the door, but the door was locked. I'll admit, I could have taken an extra moment to get someone inside the playroom to unlock the door, but I was focused solely on reaching my kid, so I gripped the handle and turned it hard enough to pop the lock out of place and shove open the door. Of course, the first face I see is Stacy, Karen's little spoiled brat, staring up at me with wide eyes because the door had nearly hit her when I forced it open. In the next moment, my daughter is clinging to me, tears streaking down her cheeks. She was in full panic, screeching at me what had happened. Apparently, she wasn't playing the way Stacy had wanted her to play, and when they started to argue, daughter tried to leave instead of fight. That's when Stacy locked the door and stood in front of it so daughter couldn't leave the room. Stacy is a bit older and taller so daughter couldn't make her move and that is when she started screaming for help. I was so angry and I tried to talk to Stacy to show her how her actions affect other people. That child has absolutely no empathy. She just shrugged and that was my tipping point. I announced loudly that daughter wasn't to play with Stacy anymore, picked up daughter and carried her to my wife, her parent of choice. Only when Stacy started crying did anyone else get involved. All those adults, no one responded to my kids screaming for help, but as soon as Stacy tears up, the whole world stops. Karen, Stacy's mom, followed me into the front room, yelling about how mean I am to children. She's just a child, was thrown out more than once. I realized I had started a full-blown fight and was about to tell my wife we should just leave when wife goes into mother bear mode. I should mention that at this point, my wife was about five months pregnant with our second child and very hormonal. She saw daughter crying, heard Karen yelling at me, and something in her snapped. Usually, she's very soft-spoken, so much so that her family thought I somehow control her every thought and action, hence them blaming me for turning her gay. They no longer believe that after this day. My wife and Karen get into a screaming match. Wife steps toe-to-toe -to -toe with her older cousin, who's used to pushing wife around. They're yelling so viciously that my mother-in-law ducks between them to guide daughter out from in between them and distract her. It was a really smooth rescue on her part, actually. I don't even remember what was all said, but Karen accused me of child abuse, and wife told her how badly she was failing Stacy as a parent to allow her to act the way she does. Everyone else was stunned for a few moments watching the exchange. I had never heard my wife yell like that, and I'm sure it was a surprise to the rest of the family. Karen's mom, a saint of a woman we'll call the doctor, tried to break up the argument that was now center stage, and wife marched outside into the drizzle because she was still so pissed. Mother-in-law was in the kitchen coloring with daughter, so I followed wife outside to try calm her down. I swear it was like a scene from a cartoon where wife was pacing and shouting angrily in the driveway, and I'm just following her helplessly behind. After a few minutes, the doctor pokes her head out the door and hollers, you're going to get that baby sick if you don't come inside. That got wife to listen, and we head back inside, both damp. Mother-in-law is just inside the door, ready to steer wife away from Karen, and the doctor is telling Karen she may want to just pack up for the day. I sit back in the corner seat and let the family sort the drama out, feeling kind of smug about how quickly wife had come to mine and daughter's defense. Karen made it quick. She packed up her things and the doctor escorted her and Stacy to the door. Just before stepping out, Karen turns to me and spits, You should be nicer to children, OP. I just smirk and say, You should teach your child to play nicely with others. She gasped in anger and was about to say something else, but the doctor gently pushed her out the door and helped her to her car. 
After we left, the family tried to blame daughter for the trouble in the playroom, saying she was making mountains out of molehills and I overreacted. We were the black sheep for a little while. A year later, wife and I graduated from college and we were having a celebratory dinner with her family. It was pleasant. Karen wasn't there with her demon semen, but the doctor showed up. She's a nice lady, so no trouble there, until we were all getting ready to leave. I was waiting for wife and the doctor sits next to me to make small talk. What are my plans after graduating? graduation. Are my parents happy for me? Just pleasant stuff. And then she says it. You know, we were talking to the other kids in the playroom that day and they said Stacy didn't lock the door. They all told me when it happened that she was the only one who touched the lock. Right. But we spoke to them later and they finally admitted that she didn't. I stayed silent. So, you know, we can let it go. I have let it go. You didn't need to bully those kids into lying for you. And with that, wife came out of the restroom and I immediately stood up. Because daughter didn't want to go play at Stacy's house anymore, they all blamed me saying I was the one keeping them apart. False. My kid just understands she doesn't have to suffer abuse just because we're family. Yes, it's my truck. And no, I won't help you move. And no, you can't buy it for 50 bucks. I live in a senior housing community for people age 55 and older. We all have identical one-bedroom cottages that set up in groups of four or quads so that all of our front doors face inward toward each other. So if I open my front door, I have a very clear view of the front doors of my three neighbors and because I'm in the back of this quad, I also have a view of the parking lot area. I think the purpose of grouping the houses like this was to create a friendly and safe atmosphere. However, it's just creepy in a you have no privacy kind of way. I'm a 57 year old female disabled and have a 16 year old pickup truck that gets me where I need to go most of the time. If you've ever owned a pickup truck, you'll understand my frustration. If you haven't owned one, talk to anyone who has and they'll tell you that according to friends, family, acquaintances, neighbors, and even complete strangers, you have it so that you can help them move, haul furniture or a tree they cut down and anything else they can't fit in the trunk of their car. And because it's a pickup truck, it can be mistreated, abused, dented, scratched, beaten up, and treated like a piece of heavy construction equipment. And you shouldn't care because, well, it's a truck. I have a neighbor, female, about 65 years old, that has kind of made a pest of herself since the day I moved in. I've done my best to be neighborly, nice, and accommodating, but each time I interact with her, I'm left feeling used. The neighbor, let's call her Karen, has come over pretending to want to visit with me, which she does for maybe about two minutes and then asks me for something. In the three years that I've been here, she's asked me to set up two TVs at different times, take a new alarm clock out of its packaging, and then teach her how to operate it. I've been asked to fill out her food stamp paperwork, fill out information for her lease renewal, read a piece of mail to her and explain it because she didn't understand it, to take her places and to loan her money for the bus. That's just a few. Now that you get the idea of what I've dealt with before, it's time for the story. One Monday morning, Karen comes beating on my door. She does what I call a cop knock, loud, hard, and repeated, around 8 a.m., waking me up. I'm a night owl, by the way. I go to the door and she's standing there holding her natural gas bill telling me how she needed a ride to the gas company's office to talk to them about paying the bill and hands me the bill. I look at it, hoping to find a phone number for her to call, but there isn't one. But I do see that her bill is $17. So I take her across town with her providing the directions because I had never been to this building. The gas company did not have an office in town, so I guess this was maybe a payment center. I drop her at the front, park and wait for her. Karen comes out saying that they can't help her there and asks me if she could just call them to make arrangements to make payments since she didn't have the money. I tell her that's what I would do and bring her back home. We basically made this trip for nothing. Two days later, there's another loud, repeated banging on my door, waking me up just before 9 a.m. Karen is back and seems to be a little frantic. She needs a ride again. This time, she's very vague about why she wants to go, but left me with the impression that something was going to get turned off, repossessed, or turned over to collections if she didn't go. She's also vague as to where she wants to go. She keeps telling me that it's down by the casino, across the street from the gas station. 
I told her I'd take her, but she would have to point me in the right direction since I've never been to the casino. She gives me turn-by-turn -turn directions until she has me turn left onto the entrance road for the casino. I'm looking around for any other businesses or even the gas station, and I'm not seeing anything other than the casino in front of us and open land on either side. So I ask her where am I supposed to be dropping her. Karen points to an upcoming sign and says, see the sign that says valet? Just follow that sign. Yep. You guessed it. Karen had me drop her at the front entrance to the casino. She lied to me by omission. She didn't ask me to take her to the casino, which I would probably have done since it's none of my business how she spends her money. She asked me to take her to a business near the casino. Yeah, well, I wasn't happy. On Monday, she couldn't afford to pay $17 gas bill, and on Wednesday, she's going to the casino by tricking me into taking her. A week goes by, and I'm in the office paying my rent when Karen comes in. Karen. Why did you tell me you were coming here today, girl? I just walked all the way here. Me. Didn't know you needed a ride. I can give you a ride back to the house if you like. I wait while Karen pays her rent and we walk out together. Now, I'm expecting to get in my truck and drive the four blocks back to my house. Karen had another idea. Karen. Take me to Everything's Cheap store. Me. Where? Karen. To Everything's Cheap. Just turn here at the stop sign and I'll show you. It's not far. Me. Karen. I'm going to take you there, but I'm not shopping and I'm not going to sit in the parking lot and wait for you. You'll have to get another ride home or walk. Karen. It's fine. I won't be long. I drop her at the front and I go home. A couple of hours later, she bangs on my door. Karen. Where did my ride go? Me. Home. I told you that I wasn't going to wait for you. Karen. I had all my stuff that I had to carry home. Now my back hurts. Me. I'm sorry, but I warned you. Karen walks away muttering things that I didn't understand and slammed her door. Skip ahead several months and I run into Karen again as I'm paying my rent. She wants me to give her a ride to the social security office. I tell her that I can't as my truck is not running right and I can't get too far from home in it until I get it checked out and fixed. My truck started having issues and it's been difficult trying to get it fixed with lockdown. A back issue that left me bedridden for several weeks and two major hurricanes this year. There's nothing major wrong with the truck, just needs a new starter and gaskets to fix an oil leak that's caused the starter to go bad. Karen, but it's just a few blocks away and it's hot out here. Me, I can't trust my truck not to leave me stranded with no way to get it home. Karen, It'll be fine. Me. Maybe, but I'm not willing to risk it. Karen slaps the side of my truck and continues on her walk and I go home in my truck. Another three days go by and more banging on my door and again, I'm awakened. It's 7.15 a.m. This time, I'm angry and I snatch the door open. Me. What? Karen, standing there with her purse and house keys in her hand as if she knows I'll say yes. I need to go to the mattress store. I need to pick up my new queen size mattress. Me. No. My truck still isn't running right. Karen. But I need your truck to haul the mattress home. Me. No. Karen. It's not a heavy mattress. Me. Oh, so who's going to help you get it in and out of my truck and carry it into your house? Karen. The two of us can do it. Karen. I have degenerative disc disease. The discs in my spine are disintegrating. I can't lift nor carry a mattress even with someone helping. Karen, but I already bought it. How am I going to get it home? Me, call friends or family to help you. Karen, they don't have a truck and you do. Me, yes, I have a truck, but there's no sign anywhere on it that says free moving company. I close the door on her and go back to bed. An hour later, more knocking. This time, it's an older man. Man 1. Excuse me, but is that your truck? He points at my truck in the parking lot. Me. Yes. Man 1. I have an upright piano I need to move and was wondering if I could use your truck. Me. No. I glance over at the neighbor's house and I see her peeking through a crack in her door. I have a sneaking suspicion she has put this guy up to this to see if I would help him. Man 1. You can drive the truck. I just need to have the piano hauled to my storage unit. Me. How are you going to get an upright piano into the bed of my truck? Man 1. I'll just roll it up a ramp and into the back. Me. Do you know how much an upright piano weighs? One person can't push it up a ramp. If you use a ramp on a tailgate, you'll break the tailgate and probably lose the piano in the process. 
My truck is large, but the rear end is not made for hauling a piano and will cause the front end to lift off the ground, preventing my front wheel drive truck from gaining traction and straining my 16 year old engine. Man one, well, could you call four or five of your male friends to help lift it into the back of the truck? Me, no. I closed the door on this man too. He didn't come right out and say it, but I felt like he wanted to borrow my truck so he could go pick up the mattress for Karen. Yeah, I'm a little suspicious. The following morning, I ignore the knocking that occurs every half hour or so over a three hour period until she finally gives up. Later that afternoon, I open my door to get the mail out of my box when a second man approaches me out of nowhere. It's like he was hiding around the corner waiting for me to come out of my house. Man 2 points at my truck. It irritates me every time someone does this. Is that your truck? Me, feeling very annoyed and snarky. What gave it away? Is it because it's parked in a space clearly labeled with my house number? Or is it because someone told you who the truck belonged to? I pointed to Karen's house. Man 2, does it run? Me, listen, I don't know what you're wanting me to pick up, deliver, move, haul, transport, or tow, but I'm not a moving company, taxi, Uber, delivery service, or a tow truck. I won't be doing any of those things, and before you ask, I won't be allowing you or anyone else to drive my truck either. Now, do you have any other questions? Man 2, uh, do you want to sell it? Me, what? Why would I want to sell it? Man 2, well, since it needs fixing, I thought maybe you would want to sell it to someone who could afford to fix it. Me, how do you know it needs fixing? Man 2, turns bright red and can't take his eyes off the ground. I just thought if you sold it, you could buy something else and I could fix the truck. Me, tell Karen that I'm not selling you my truck so that you can fix it to give to her. Man 2, I wasn't going to give it to her. Me, pointing at his huge truck parked in Karen's designated space. You want me to believe that you would rather have my 16-year-old truck that needs repair than your brand new truck? How stupid do you think I am? As the older man silently stares at the ground, Karen flings her door open and marches up to me. Karen, just sell him your truck so he can fix it. You clearly aren't going to do it anytime soon. At least he'll put it to good use. I need it and I need it more than you apparently do. Now, he's willing to get it fixed for me, so just sell him the damn truck already. Me, my truck is not for sale. When or if I get my truck fixed is absolutely none of your business. Karen, I'm going to call the office and tell them that you have a broken down truck sitting in the parking lot that needs to be hauled to the junkyard. They'll make you get rid of it or fix it. Man 2, Karen, they can't do anything to her. Karen cuts him off. She's so angry, she's crying, shaking, and spitting as she screams. Karen, shut up. Stay out of this. I want that truck and I'm going to get it. I'll call the police. They'll make her get rid of it. Man 2, Karen, the police aren't. She cuts him off again. Karen. Yes, they will. They'll listen to me. She storms off to call the police. In the meantime, I brought a chair outside along with a can of soda and a bowl of microwave popcorn. I figured this was going to be a good show. Karen and Man 2 have gone inside her house to wait. The neighbor to my left has come out to see what's going on. Let's call her Mary. Mary can't stand Karen. So she drags a chair out and sits next to me and we share my popcorn. Enter Cop 1 and Cop 2. The cops arrive in about 5 to 6 minutes and walk up to Karen's door and knock while glancing around at Mary and me and grinning. She answers and tells them that I've created an eyesore in the neighborhood by having an old beat up broken down truck sitting in the parking lot and she wants it removed immediately. Cop 1, pointing at my truck, yep, he does it too and I can't help but roll my eyes. That truck? Karen, yes. Cop 1. That truck is clean, shiny, no dents, no scratches, new tires. Are you sure that's the eyesore? Karen, yes, it's 10 years old and broken and she doesn't want to fix it. It's just sitting there doing nothing for 9 months. Me, it's 16 years old. Cop 2, spins around surprised. Seriously? That truck is that old? Wow, it's in great shape. You've taken good care of her. Me, thank you. Karen, I want that truck gone. Cop 2 walks over to me to discuss my truck's mechanical history. So I explain to them that in the 16 years that I've owned her, I've changed her oil every 3 to 4 months, given her a bath once a month, 
got her a new set of tires 6 years ago and when I first began having problems with her starting, I bought a new battery, the old one was the original battery from when I bought the truck off the showroom floor and when the battery wasn't the problem, I had a mechanic come and look at it. He determined that it was the starter and the gasket was leaking. All I was waiting on was my friend to come and help me start her. Someone needs to get under the truck and tap the starter while someone else turns over the ignition so that I can get it to the mechanic's house for him to work on it. Karen, she's lying. That truck hasn't moved in three months. Me, offering popcorn to cop two, who took a handful. Wrong, it hasn't moved in four days. It's had problems for three to four months. Cop one, Miss Karen, there really isn't anything the police department can do for you. Her truck definitely isn't an eyesore, nor is it sitting there in pieces creating a safety hazard. Karen, she's driving down property values. Cop one, starts chuckling. Miss Karen, you're renting a house in government subsidized senior housing. Cop 2, why don't you tell us the real reason why you want her truck removed? Mary, who has been silent until now, stands up and turns on her best diva soul sister voice and attitude and gives the cops the greatest deep south beautiful black woman sermon I've ever heard. I'll try to write it as best I can. Oh Lord Jesus, help us all. This here woman of the night want everything she can't have. Lord, I think it's cause she pulls her hair back so tight. Lord, she can only see what's in the back of her mind. Uh-huh. She wants her old saggy boy toy of the day here to buy my friend's pickup truck so she can go and pick him up. Lord, mm-hmm. If you're getting what I'm saying, he buy it and trade it to her for a little roll on her nasty sheets. Lord Jesus, help us. And she thinks she all hot and sexy, so you believe her and take away my friend's truck. She a fool, uh-huh. She thinks she can fool you too, uh-huh. How the hell do you think she got those two big-ass TVs in there? Mm-hmm. Cop 1 is bent over laughing hysterically while Cop 2 is standing with his mouth open and his eyes wide. Cop 2 turns to Man 2. Is any of that true? Man 2, embarrassed, humiliated, and just looking tired. She wanted the truck and 50 bucks. Karen and Man 2 are arrested. Not sure what the exact charges were, but I heard words being thrown around like pandering, solicitation, scamming, and false complaint, among others. A couple of days later, Mary told me that Karen returned home. I guess she found a way to get bailed out. I haven't seen her, and I'm hoping that I don't. As for my pickup truck, I'm still waiting to get her to the mechanic. My friend will be here on his next day off. He doesn't get them often to help me. It's a good thing I'm a patient person with a super diva as a friend and neighbor. It's also good to know that my truck is at least worth one 20 minute roll on the sheets and 50 bucks. Corrupt manager wants me to reject crucial supplies. I do as instructed. About a couple decades ago, I used to work at a concrete production plant for a reputable construction company. Our company, like several other construction companies, were awarded a portion of a larger project. A large portion of land was earmarked for setting up temporary office buildings and concrete plants for the different construction companies. The sites were separated by temporary barriers and had separate entrances. As many of you know or may not know, concrete is produced by mixing cement, water, sand, and stone grits size 20 mm plus 10 mm along with special admixtures in a specific ratio. Our recipe also contained a special ingredient, stone dust. Turns out only our company used stone dust in our concrete and the neighbors did not. So a special truckload full of stone dust was specially shipped for us. This is important later. My job entailed orchestrating concrete delivery to our project sites apart from regular quality control tasks like checking incoming materials for quality, etc. Only after I had signed the delivery receipts, our store's personnel would unload the trucks at designated areas. A log of all trucks entering and leaving the concrete batching plant would be kept by security at gate relevant later. Since my job entailed checking incoming material before accepting, the suppliers would usually try to offer some petty bribes from cash to booze to flesh, if you know what I mean. I always declined such offers as once accepted, you became their dog and lose all respect in their eyes. Moreover, bad material also impacted the quality of concrete produced. Strength, consistency, and setting time to name a few. Since concrete delivery was also part of my job, it was in my best interest to only accept good material, otherwise the client would chew me up during casting. One night, a supplier truck 
entered the premises with 20 mm stone chips. Upon testing, I found them to be undersized for 20 mm and oversized for 10 mm. I went ahead and rejected the load. The driver and supplier started pestering me, offering bribes and whatnot. When I didn't budge, they called my boss who asked me what was going on. I explained that the quality of material was unacceptable and I've rejected this. When I mentioned it's too small for 20mm, he ordered me to dump it in the 10mm bin anyway. I knew what that meant. My boss was on the supplier's payroll. A couple of weeks passed by and my boss asked me to reject a truckload of material from a very reliable supplier. He knew that the supplier was only delivering stone dust that day and should we reject the material, the entire load would be a waste and a loss to the supplier. Once the stone chips or stone dust has left the quarry, they for some reason can't bring it back. Hence, my boss wanted it to hit the supplier where it hurt most, especially stone dust as there was no other company that would take it. Q, malicious compliance. I called the supplier, who had become a friend by now, and told him that I was under orders to reject the truck. He panicked and told me that my boss was putting pressure on him for bribes. This particular supplier believed in providing quality material and always visited my lab to understand how I tested the material and what my requirements were. He would then go back to his quarry and adjust the equipment to deliver the best quality materials. Because he put so much effort in improving the quality of his product, he did not budge and bow down to my boss's demands. I asked the supplier friend to route a truckload of 20mm stone chips meant for some other company to my plant first. I would let the gate security log the truck's entry and then promptly reject the material. He was then supposed to send the stone dust which I would accept and be done with my task. Everything happened as planned. I completed my remaining activities for the night and went home. When I came back to work in the evening, my boss was waiting for me at the door. As expected, he had checked the entry slash exit log as well as material receipt history. He had noticed that I had accepted the stone dust and was chewing his anger, waiting for me to explain. He very casually asked me if I had rejected a truckload. I acted dumb and answered an affirmation. I told him that the very first truck, a 20 millimeter, was rejected. Now, usually 20 millimeter is never rejected, especially from this supplier. So he asked me what reason did I give while rejecting the truckload. I said flakiness index, a test we never do as a field test, but is mandated by the client to be done once a quarter. He knew that I was playing him, but he couldn't do anything. I had done exactly what he asked me to do, reject a truckload. I had covered my bases with the security log as well as material receipt, so he just muttered something under his breath and never mentioned this to me again or asked me to do anything similar. Two months later, he was transferred to a different site and I became the overall in charge. Same designation and pay, just more responsibilities.